good morning. We're glad to have you here with us today. If this is your first time at Faith Baptist Church, or if you're joining us online for the first time, would you do us a favor and either uh, fill out a visitor card there at the church and get that uh, uh, taken to either uh, Brother Josh Saver or somebody who might be there to collect that, and they'll make sure to get that to me. Also, you can do so by going to our church website and uh, by emailing us uh, through the uh, Contact Us tab. Um, or through just our email address. And so the website would be fbc-iwakuni.org, and the email address would be fbciwakuni at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to be able to know that, this, that you've come and visited today uh, or that you've joined with us online, and we'd love to be able to reach out to you and just make sure that you know how thankful we are. Um, and also just put some materials in your hand as well. Uh, our, our primary concern is not that uh, necessarily that you're present there, even though we do love that, you're, that you are present today, uh, but our primary concern is that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And we'd love to talk with you more about that. So please help us out by getting that visitor card filled so that we can know that you came and visited with us today. Also, uh, for our church family, we do ask you this morning uh, to please be in prayer for Brother Lawrence Taylor. As of the recording of this uh, sermon, uh, he was, had just finished surgery, and there was some complications, and they had to have a second surgery. And so um, we may have better news by Sunday, Lord willing. Um, but for now, if you could please just pray with us for his recovery uh, from surgery. Um, that way, uh, we were just praying that God would just bless and help there and be with him and Miss Nobumi as well. Uh, but we hope to have better things to be able to say in the coming days. And so please be in prayer with us about that. But we sure are glad to have you here today. And so let's go ahead and take the Word of God together this morning. And turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and if you found your place there, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me and honor the reading of God's Word in this first reading, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 1, and we'll start there. And the Bible says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye uh, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for today. We thank you for the wonderful blessing it is to be able to gather in your name um, as we're able to, Lord. And I know some folks weren't able to be at the church house today uh, due to some restrictions from the base and things of that nature. And so, God, we do ask that you please just be with each of our church family uh, where they're gathered right now, Lord. We pray that uh, they'd find a way to be able to... Um, uh, uh, fellowship and we encourage one another, Father. We know this is not your ultimate desire that a church be splintered up in many different places, but sometimes, uh, Lord, the uh, situation of the hour uh, necessitates that. And so, God, we do ask you to please be with each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to be an encouragement to each other. And Lord, we do thank you for means like this that we have to be able to, uh, in a digital way, uh, be able to uh, communicate with one another. And so, Father, I pray that you'd bless this time as only you can. Um, Lord, give understanding, give wisdom, give discernment. Uh, and Lord, we do pray for those that might have heavy hearts today. Uh, we are uh, thinking even of Lawrence Taylor, Father. And Lord, I, I don't know what the future holds the next several days for him, but we do look to you in faith, asking that you'd raise him up and or that you'd heal him, Lord. Uh, Father, that he'd recover quickly from the surgery without any major complications. And Lord, that uh, they would be, we would be able to rejoice um, in him being able to recover fully from uh, this uh, uh, complication that he's had even from the surgery. Lord, we do rejoice in uh, the, the wonderful tools that doctors do have today, but ultimately healing comes from your hand, Father. And so we do ask for your uh, help in that as only you can do now. We do love you. We thank you for this time, and we do ask you to please be with us this morning so we can grow and, be more, and, and live lives that are even more pleasing to you through what you've accomplished for us through your son, Jesus Christ, and his death, burial, and resurrection. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 
Well, we want to thank you again for being here, and thank you so much for uh, just praying for the Taylor family. Um, we do look forward to hearing good news on that regard. And I do want to mention before we jump into this uh, scripture, uh, Brother uh, Riker Lewis, this would have been his last Sunday um, with us there at Faith Baptist Church, and with just as, as only the Lord knew would happen. Um, uh, things have kind of restricted to where he wasn't able to be there today. Um, but I do want to say publicly how thankful I am for, the, uh, for his faithfulness. Um, he has been such a blessing to our church family. Um, and we're going to try to send him some things along the way here as he gets settled in, in California. Um, the, the Lord would just bless him and help him and, uh, and guide him as he tries to find a new church home while he's there. Um, please be in prayer for him. A lot of traveling and transition that needs to take place. And I know his heart was to be with us today, um, but he wasn't able to. And so we do uh, ask you to pray for him. Um, and if you can, just send him an email or maybe even uh, just write him a note or something and, and, and give that to him. But just let him know how thankful you are uh, for how God has used him, not only in leading our music at our church, but also in Sunday school and teaching there. And, and really, it's been a blessing to uh, e even be there and to hear him teach um, uh, the the, uh, the truths of Scripture uh, on a uh, through the curriculum that we're using has been such a blessing, and, and the doctrinal soundness of it has been such an encouragement to me uh, that I've not had to worry too much about anything that is being preached from the pulpit there at Faith Baptist Church because we've had folks of like mind and faith uh, do uh, partake or participating and laboring with us together, and so so thankful for that. And really, that's kind of where we're at with with First Thessalonians here in chapter number one. You know, last week we talked much about kind of the backdrop of this epistle, and it is an epistle of hope and, and, and examination. Um, here is a church where the Apostle Paul opens up this letter and, and begins to talk about the, the, the characteristics and the, and, the, and the fiber, really, of these believers here at Thessalonica. As we look into this faith-filled letter of examination, we do find that Paul begins with a word of commendation. He commends them for a few things in verses 2 and 3 where he says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And he mentions three specific areas here where he does rejoice and where he, he's thankful for what God is doing through them, and that is through their work of faith, and labor of love, and patience of hope in Jesus Christ. Now, we won't probably get to that third one today, uh, but we'll definitely cover these first two thoughts of, of their work of faith and labor of love. And this opening portion, by the way, on, on a, as, a, as a kind of a side note, um, the, the thought occurred to me as a, the blessing and reminder that it is, um, as Paul opens this letter of examination with a thought of commendation, it's an encouragement to us as well that as, as those as we are obediently striving to invest in folks that the Lord allows us to disciple, uh, that we that we don't just um, have the intention of criticizing them or or arguing with them on a con on a constant basis, but that as we disciple people, that we would have eyes of grace and eyes of mercy, and that we would allow ourselves to uh, um, commend them in areas where they're growing and being strong. Really, that's part of what edification is. Edification is not just tearing down, but it is also building up. And I think sometimes we get so caught up with the tearing down of the old man uh, in Christ that we uh, fail to focus on what's being accomplished in the new man. And so we ought not be that way. And so as you're as you are laboring to uh, be obedient to the Lord and, and discipling others and leading others to Christ and, and involved in helping others learn the scriptures as we should be as believers, uh, we do pray that, that we were, as a reminder here that it was the, from, the less, from the example of the Apostle Paul and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God as he writes these words, uh, that we be a people of, uh, that are, are easy to commend people for the areas that they are growing in. It, it's a biblical reality, as we saw over in chapter 3 last week in verse number 10, that there are some areas of their faith that is lacking. Uh, they do need to grow. Uh, but growth comes with not just the tearing down, as we said, but also the building up. And for that, I am so grateful. I'm so thankful for those in my life that God has used uh, to give me a stern word of... of, 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 of um, rebuke when I needed it, uh, but I'm so thankful for those also that came alongside and gave me that loving uh, admonition of edification to help me to grow in my walk with the Lord, and, and truly none of us would be where we are today if it wasn't for those two things. Uh, and so Paul, in this word of encouragement, reveals the first place these believers stood firm in the Lord, and that is their salvation. You, you realize here in verse numbers three and four, these, uh, these commendations of things that they are doing actively or characteristics of the fiber of this church rest in verse number four. And let's read that together just to make sure we remind ourselves of this. It says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith 
and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, again, he states uh, in, in uh, this thought, thought in verse 4 of their election of God, and we rem- were reminded this week, as we were last week, this is not implying the false Reformed theology of so-called predestination to salvation, but is rather a, a, a contextual reference to the obvious Holy Spirit guidance that they received uh, to take the gospel into Macedonia that we saw in Acts chapter 16 and 17. Uh, this is not something where God selects a certain group of people that can be saved and they're saved, and God selects certain people that cannot be saved and they will never be able to be saved. That is not what this is teaching at all this morning, but rather Paul alluding to, as we find in verse 5, uh, the reality that, that there was a, an obvious Holy Spirit calling of this team of, of, of traveling uh, preachers to go into the regions of Macedonia and take the gospel with them and see churches planted. And I firmly believe Paul still uh, marveled at how God led them into the regions of Macedonia and what God's grace enabled them to accomplish in the establishment of local church bodies like that that we find here in Thessalonica. And I, and I wonder, do we also marvel at the work of God in the hearts of people? Does it cause us to stop and pause and give a word of praise and gratitude? Uh, do we marvel uh, the fact that God could use someone like us to bring the gospel to somebody else? And, and, and do we marvel that God used someone else to bring the gospel to us? Uh, how... how uh, and, and, we ask our, and we must ask ourselves, how are we being used to bring the gospel to somebody else? You know, the whole reason that Paul was used of God to take the gospel into the regions of Macedonia um, and really ultimately to this, this, this area of Thess- the city of Thessalonica was because he was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't think you could take the gospel to any wrong place. One, one preacher once wisely said, there's no wrong place to plant a church. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are to be a people of faith that are following the leading of God's Holy Spirit. And, and truly the Lord, as he works in the heart of every man, knows when the time is right and the time is ripe to have the gospel placed in somebody's life uh, according to the Lord's wisdom. And so uh, we ought to be leaning upon the Lord. And, and though I firmly believe uh, that this, this is the reality, um, we also must understand uh, that uh, the, the, the work of the gospel, that as we just stated, must be the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And we know it's for everybody. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And then he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He died for all. What's the purpose of Christ dying for all if all could not possibly be saved? It would be a wasteful and God does not waste uh, his sacrifice. And so 1 John 2, 2 also says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And so obviously the Lord has made an allowance, the Lord has made it possible for every man, woman, boy, or girl that is able to cognitively understand uh, their stance before the Lord and their guilt before the Lord to be able to understand their need for salvation. And if, if they decide to receive that gift of Jesus Christ, the, the, there, is, there is grace for them, and there is a, a payment for their sin in Christ Jesus. The Thessalonians believers rejoiced when the good news of the gospel came their way. We find this in verse 6 where it says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word, in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And really, as, we're, as we look forward into this, the, the moral fiber, or the character of this local church, we're going to find this is a common thread, a theme for them, that in much affliction and in persecution, they still retained a great amount of joy. And it wasn't because of what they were doing, but the reason why they were doing what they were doing. You see, they found their security in the Lord. And this security in salvation uh, was what help, uh, was what motivated them in the work of God. And the same is true for us today. If we are going to stand firm in the Lord, if we will stand fast in the Lord, then it will be because we have a firm anchor in salvation 
and the fact that we are secure in Christ Jesus. Uh, if you're constantly pacing around through life, wondering if you're going to make it because of something you did or didn't do, uh, if you're going to have to, if you're pacing through life, wondering if, if today was the day you sinned the final sin and now you're cut off from the Lord forever, if you do not have assurance of your salvation, then you cannot in boldness proclaim the gospel to people if you do not firmly stand in the gospel yourself and fully understand it. So in order to... to exercise the great zeal and really the great and to exercise these things that we find in this church this local body that are commended by Paul you and I must also have a firm grip on our security in the Lord and so the believers of Thessalonica they too uh, had a had a firm belief in the Lord we find in verse number 8 uh, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And so he makes a reference here to the faith, the hope that these believers had in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that it wasn't themselves, it wasn't their labor, it wasn't anything they could do uh, that was going to save them from the wrath to come, but it was the fact that Jesus Christ was uh, died, was buried, and rose again, uh, and their faith in that finished work of Christ, that, that they believed they were secure and safe from the wrath of God to come. Um, and truly, you and I must get to that point as well. We, we cannot work our way to heaven, as we've talked about before. We cannot uh, earn our way to heaven. Rather, we must fu fully throw ourselves uh, uh, at the feet of Jesus and embrace it by faith the fact that he is that finished work of salvation and what he accomplished. Uh, we find in this thought of stability and salvation's plan that the Thessalonians had, we find in God's, uh, that in God's omniscience, he always had a plan to afford us the chance to be restored back to himself. In God's omniscience, he always had a plan to afford us the chance to be restored back to himself. And we find this over in Ephesians chapter 1. So if you hold your place here with me and go back just a little bit to uh, a, few, a few letters in the New Testament uh, toward that direction, and you'll find Ephesians chapter number 1, right after the book of Galatians. Um, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 1. And while you're turning there, I want to say it was a blessing this past Wednesday uh, to be able to spend time with our church family in prayer, uh, but also to be, as we're looking through this thought of the flesh and, and defining what is the flesh and how has how the Lord delivered us from the bondage of the flesh and the sin nature and how we can live victoriously in Christ. And so really just a, a wonderful study we've been able to start on. And I want to invite you to be there as well. We do this over Zoom. Uh, so if you would like to take part in our Zoom call on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. Japan time, I would invite you just to email me. Let me know by at fbciwakuni at gmail.com and say, hey, pastor, can you please send me the information for this Zoom meeting? We'll get that to you as, as best we can. Uh, or you can, well, I'll post it also in our, uh, our church family group chat so you can see that on Facebook as well and jump in there. But here we are, Ephesians chapter number one, and we're talking about the stability and salvation's plan and how in God's omniscience, he always had a plan to afford us this chance to be restored to himself even before uh, the fall with Adam and Eve. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now that in Christ is very important, so please make note of that. Verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him, again this is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so this verse states clearly that the Father has chosen that in Christ we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And so God in his will, his good, in his omniscience, he has had, had predetermined that when we place our faith in Christ, when we receive his free gift of salvation uh, that is extended to every man, that God has already predestined, he's already predetermined that those that receive Christ will be placed into Christ and receive this adoption of children. Um, and, and really by that, the inheritance that we have through Christ to eternal life and, and other spiritual great spiritual blessings. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted 
in the beloved in whom we have redemption uh, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, and even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And so for those of us that have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, there are some things that God in his omniscience had already set in motion that these things will take place. Uh, 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 when, when we place our faith in Christ, these things will happen to enable us to be able to uh, be successful in the Christian life and bring glory to Him. And so, without and, and we could uh, uh, we could really wax long on all of these things. And without fully unpacking all that flows from these doctrinally rich scriptures, the relevant thoughts to the, to the point we're making here today uh, about the Thessalonian believers and their security in Christ is found in verses three and four, where we find the Father determined that in Christ we would have all have access to such heavenly blessings as what we read about in other portions of Scripture, like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, um, and also access to His presence and the ability to pray directly to Him uh, by the name of Christ. And so we have great spiritual blessings, uh, from or, or heavenly blessings, uh, that God has afforded to us. And really, that's just scratching the surface, but two that really speak to my heart uh, as far as this thought of having this indwelling of His Spirit. You know, really, we, we know there's some confusion today about this thought of... Uh, uh, the tribulation. And there are many that are confused today and illiterate about Scripture, um, and they, they are assuming that because of this pandemic and some political turmoil in America, that somehow we are, in the, we are already in the tribulation. And I'm, I'm sorry, friend, if you really read the book of Revelation and really study it literally uh, in the places where it's obviously literal, um, I'm telling you, uh, we are definitely not in the tribulation. But I will tell you this, we are in the last days, is what the Lord refers to in other portions of Scripture. And we are leaning into that time when the rapture will take place and the church will be removed. Um, that will be very important because we find in Scripture that at some point there's going to be a transition back to what we find in the Old Testament where holy, the Holy Spirit will indwell certain individuals for certain purposes. Um, but that is not the case during this current church age. And the Lord has promised that we have this blessed presence of the Holy Spirit on the moment of salvation and that his presence will remain with us uh, until we are with him in glory. And so what a blessing, pro blessed promise that is. Uh, but we don't want to confuse scripture uh, on the prophetic timeline. That leads to a lot of problems. And so if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're thinking along that line that we're currently in the tribulation, I invite you to go and study the book of Revelation. Really look through it and, and read about the, 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 what will really take place during that time. And I'm telling you, COVID pales in comparison to what God has in store for the, as far as his wrath is concerned during that time of tribulation. And so please uh, do yourself a favor and really study the word of God there and get yourself grounded so that you won't be pulled away from these uh, false teachers or those that are trying to sway people into thinking that somehow this is already the tribulation. Um, and that would do you a lot of help there. But in this place we find uh, in verse three and four that we have such wonderful heavenly blessings, but those are in Christ. And that is what God determined uh, that it would be in Christ, that in salvation, in the finished work of Christ, these things would come to us. Secondly, in verse 4, the Father determined that in Christ we would be made holy, that is distinctly sanctified, and without blame justified in the sight of God. And so we find here in verse number 5, having pre, uh, verse number 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, and there's a parenthetical there before the foundation of the world, uh, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So even before the foundation of the world, the Lord had, de had determined and chosen that in Christ we would be holy and without blame. And so really the focus here is not us in this passage. The contextual focus here is Christ and what God the Father had, had predetermined in Christ he would afford to those who place their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And, and really it comes down to this thought of this, uh, the fact that verse 7, to, in whom we have redemption through through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom 
and prudence. And we're reminded in 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Uh, Jesus Christ is that satisfactory payment that pays the penalty for your sin and my sin, and that, pen- that, and that payment is available for every man, woman, boy, or girl that dots the face of this globe if they will just turn to uh, God in his wisdom. And you say, well, what about those who might not have, ha- have heard the gospel directly yet? What about those who don't have somebody who might be preaching to them right now. Well, I venture to say that's fewer and fewer these days with the, the luxuries we have today of modern technology. You know, we have the ability to post things on YouTube and other things of that nature. Um, and so people around the world are listening to messages that they might not have been able to hear otherwise. But, but I do, you know, I do believe that even without that direct revelation, from the word of God going out as it is. Uh, There are other ways that God reveals himself to mankind as we find in scriptures. And so we don't just find that uh, in God's omniscience, he always had a plan to afford us the chance to be restored back to himself. But we also know that in God's wisdom, he uses several means to reveal himself to man. And really, this is what the Thessalonians also rejoiced in, that God used Paul to bring the gospel to them, but that they, in their hearts and minds, were seeking the Lord because of what they knew of the Lord already. And so we find that God uses creation to reveal himself to man. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, I think every, it would do a all a lot of good, especially in today's day and age where we're so in, uh, infatuated with glowing screens in our faces and, and being surrounded in cities with man-made structures to go out into nature and get out away from the light pollution and look up into the heavens and see the vastness of God's creation and look at the handiwork of what God has done and ponder the meticulousness with it was created. And I believe with all my heart that if we would just look at creation and get a gl- real glimpse of what God has done in nature, it will drive our hearts to recognize that evolution is not the answer. This all is not some cosmic accident from some cosmic soup, but rather it is, it is a direct uh, a response to the creative word of God as he moved across and, and, and brought everything forth in six literal days. Uh, God uses creation and God uses conscience. Romans 2, 14 through 16, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. In this passage, Paul clearly says that even those that do not have the written word of God yet have the law of God on their hearts and their conscience. And it doesn't matter where you go in this world, no matter how remote you go, you will find a people with a religious system where they are trying to appease the just demands of a holy God who is angry with their sin and with, their, and with themselves. And so understand here uh, that when it comes to the, the God revealing himself to man, God reveals himself in a general fashion through creation and through conscience. But God has also revealed himself through very specific ways that are direct revelation. And we think about God's witnesses and his word in this respect. Romans chapter 10 says, how shall the, how shall, how, sorry, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And really the Lord and his wisdom has entrusted with you and with me who have trusted Christ as our Savior with a wonderful and really uh, awesome responsibility to be able to go and take the gospel to somebody else in this world who needs to hear it. And we ought to be good stewards of that call. It's not the, the responsibility of just the pastor or an evangelist or a missionary to go and take the gospel to wherever they are, but rather it is the responsibility to every believer uh, who has placed, uh, every person who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ and been a wonderful 
wonderful recipient of the gospel of Christ in faith, that they also are responsible to take that gospel to somebody else. And so God uses his witnesses, and ultimately God uses his witnesses by his word, as it says in verse number uh, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And really the, the Bible, the word of God, the communicated, revealed thoughts of the Lord and uh, to his people, through his people, is, is truly the, the, the most direct revelation, or direct means of revelation, I should say, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it is our responsibility. We ought to be so invested and so involved in trying to get the gospel uh, by word and, and, by, and by right, really, by written means, to, uh, to the regions beyond as best we can. And I am so thankful uh, for our church and for our church's desire to support more missionaries. Um, you know, I think of our mission conference, our missions emphasis month we've had this last month. And, and really uh, through November, rather, and then in, in December, voting to be able to take on two new missionaries in the Patricks and in the Martin family. And it's a blessing to me to know that we are, we are burdened to, uh, uh, to reach the regions beyond. Um, I know the Patricks, are, uh, they, they communicated how excited they were to be a part of our uh, missions, uh, our, our world missions uh, ministry. Um, and they want to be a good steward of, of what we're allowing, of what we're um, uh, trusting them to do. And so we're excited to be a part of their ministry. And the Martins, as they try to help other missionaries that are coming off the field for short-term uh, furloughs and things of that nature, as they try to relieve those missionaries by filling in the gap and helping those churches stand strong in their absence. Um, and we are, we're, we're personal recipients of that kind of ministry at our church, you know. Um, and several, you know, the Martins came and spent six months in Iwakuni, and God used them greatly. And so we're thankful as a church we can be a part of this. But uh, supporting missionaries does not negate our personal responsibility to be a witness with the Word of God to those that God allows us to come in contact with. And so we must be good stewards of that. You know, in light of this reality is a convicting thought to note that creation uh, doesn't fail to point to the creative handiwork of God. The conscience does not fail to painfully point to our need to be uh, to be uh, uh, to, to our need for peace with a uh, before a holy God, and His word does not fail to proclaim the desire of the Lord to redeem the lost. Yet, how is it those three entities can be faithful in their responsibility to point to God and the need of mankind be restored to God? Yet, it is us, His witnesses, that so often neglect God's command to take the gospel on his behalf. And I pray that's not the case today with you and with me. We ought to be such good stewards of what the gospel is and, and, and what God has done through the gospel in our lives in saving our souls and, and really separating us for his glory. Um, and so we, we go back now to 1 Thessalonians and we think about the, these Thessalonian believers and how they too were personal recipients of this wonderful process that God in his wisdom and his omniscience had predetermined would take place when someone trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And because these Thessalonian believers were so uh, solidified in, their, in, their, in the salvation that God had afforded them and how it wasn't through their own personal merit that they earned it or it wasn't some, through some religious system that they procured it, but rather it was in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone that they were uh, glad recipients of it. And because of that stability, Ability they had in the finished work of Jesus Christ and in salvation, it produced a confidence and then consequentially produced a zeal that reveals itself, secondly this morning, in, the, in their service by salvation's power. In their service by salvation's power. We don't just see salvation's plan this morning, but also this power of salvation uh, because it showed, and, this, and this power was revealed in their work of faith. Paul here in verse number three makes mention of this first aspect of their character where he mentions this work of faith. This work of faith is, is really a, 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 a administration or some, doing something on behalf of God with, 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 which is undergirded by a mentality of faith. Faith, and we find one example of this in Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight. If you want to turn there quickly with me, we'll look at this briefly. Uh, but in Second Corinthians eight, we do find a glorious example of this work of faith, uh, and a, or an example of a work of faith that this church had been a part of, um, and really other churches as well. Second Corinthians eight verse one says, "Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia." Again, this includes the church in Thessalonica. How that in a great trial of affliction, 
the abundance of their joy. See, there's those two words again. We like when we saw in, in, in 1 Thessalonians, we find it also here in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians, how there, this affliction and joy tied together. Now, I won't belabor this because we've talked about it recently in November, uh, but really it just boggles in the mind to think about how these two words, affliction, something we think is very uh, a non-happy or a non-joyful occurrence, and joy, we would think of them as opposites, and yet here we find again a description of how the, 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 even within the affliction there was an abundance of joy in the heart of the believers of Thessalonica. And it says, "...in their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality." For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus that he, as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also." You see, this, this example we have of this church of Thessalonica, or really the churches of Macedonia here, including the church in Thessalonica, is that these were a people that, that their work was not based on what they could do. It was, it was based on what God could do through them. And they learned a, a, a lesson of maturity in their walk with God that even in their early years that we personally must learn as well as believers, uh, that their joy in Christ was the supply of their physical outpouring. You see, Proverbs 17, verse 1 says, it is better, a better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. And the re- reality is that, you know, the Thessalonian believers, they, they had deep poverty, they had great affliction, yet they had great joy because they, their heart was focused not on the distractions of riches, but on the reality and the determination of what the gospel means to them to get that to somebody else. And so their eyes were fixed on Jesus and that really uh, was, the, was the heartfelt motivation of faith for them to accomplish this work um, in this given example. Um, their joy in Christ was based on assurance of God's leading. It says here, it says that they gave themselves, in verse 5, they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And so they were able to give sacrificially. They were able to give to meet the needs of somebody else and really do this work of faith because they trusted it was the will of God, not their own uh, emotional decision-making. Um, and really, this is a great uh, 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 a launching point for what Paul is going to mention here as far as this next thought, this labor of love. You see, it wasn't just a work of faith they were known for, but it was also for a labor of love, you know, because... They gave themselves to the Lord and to the purpose of serving others. And so because of the, they gave themselves to this, they were able to labor from a motivation of love, not obligation. Um, and, and really, this is what Paul is pointing to even in 2 Corinthians 8, where he says in verse 8 to the Corinthian church, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Um, and so then he goes to verse 11. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. See, a year before 2 Corinthians 8 was written, the church in Corinth had, had promised and committed to give a certain amount uh, uh, to, toward this special love offering to help the, the, the poor saints um, in Jerusalem. And because they had committed to do it, now it was, it was time to ante up on their commitment. And, and the reality is, if Corinth was this church in Corinth what happened to be a very carnal and emotionally driven church and it often struggled with the desire to be in the limelight um, and to have and to practice showy things and to, and to be very showy with their faith and that mentality may allow you to uh, uh, you know uh, it, may, it may allow your efforts to to impress some in the short term but the reality is in the long term it will reveal a disingenuousness that will ultimately be a source of great discouragement to those around you and that's what Paul even says he says look you know we we, we don't want to defraud you we don't want to put you in a bad spot uh, but he says you know uh, perform the doing of this uh, because we don't want to we want to come and then we're empty handed and essentially is what he tell he's say, saying um, throughout this passage and so he's trying to tell him look you gave this commitment if this was a true commitment if you really meant this by the Lord then follow through and be a, be a real blessing and encouragement to those that will be the receivers of it and really it teaches us this that selfishness commits without follow through 
You know, think of Ananias and Sapphira who, who gave an offering but held back a portion for themselves and hid that portion, pretending like they gave the entirety of the, of the sale of their land. And God judged them harshly um, uh, for, for, their, for their lies uh, to, the, to, the, to other believers and ultimately to the Lord. Um, and so there was just really this, this great deception that, that took place because of selfishness. Um, you know, and you can sign up on a sign-up sheet. You can, you can put a faith promise card in a box. There's all kinds of things you can do to be showy. Um, but, the re- but the real fruit of uh, a real blessing is not in the, in, in the writing your name or in giving the, the faith promise card, but in the follow-through of that expressed faith. You know, love commits without thought of personal gain or benefit. And this is why Paul does, uh, d- describes the labor of the Thessalonians as a labor of love. Literally, their circumstances were not in their favor. This, this labor is not a fun thing. Labor is, is the sweat of the brow. It was a, a painful uh, undertaking. But it was done because of love. And so because they died to self and they, and, they, and they poured themselves out to others, they pressed on with Jesus as their example. And so God was able to use them in a work of faith and labor of love that was a blessing to many and an example to all of us even today. And this lastly trans- transferred into their, their success in, in, in salvation's proclamation their success in salvation's proclamation. You know, the faith of the Thessalonians was so resolute, so grounded by the purifying fires of trial and persecution that there was no mistaking their message. They didn't water down their message. They didn't try to hide it. No, they were quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, vocal about their love for Christ and the, and the need to, put, to place, your, to place uh, faith in Him. You see, without the anchor of salvation and the transformational relationship it births, then a work of ministry is no work of faith, but simply an empty work of religious exercise. And religious labor, especially in in, in trying seasons of difficulty, if not anchored in the love of God and a love for people that only God can give, is neither durable nor authentic. And we're seeing that in many right now. And I'm not saying that God is not moving in certain people's lives to necessarily uh, get them to to move them in different directions. I'm not saying God's not doing that at all through all of these things. Uh, But I will say this. There are many, many today that are making knee-jerk reaction decisions where they are leaving their post or they are responding emotionally about leaving church or losing faith in the Lord because of a difficult situation we find ourselves in. And believer, that thing, that ought not so to be. Um, maybe you're listening to this this morning and you've gone through a serious trial. You've lost a loved one or maybe you've, gone, you've lost a job or you've lost income or you've lost your health. I implore you, do not lose your faith in God in the season of trial. The Bible says if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And, that, and, the, and the day of adversity reveals the strength of your faith and the authenticity of it. And maybe for you today, you, this has revealed a great lack of faith in your life. And I challenge you to get on your knees before the Lord and, and ask Him to reveal if, if, your, if your relationship with Him is authentic and true. And if it is, ask Him to grow your faith and to be able to be more effect, effective for Him. You know, this was obviously true for the Thessalonian believers, and it ought to be true for you and I. If we truly grasp the gravity of all that salvation is, no bureaucrat, no cultural shift, no castigating glare of society, will be able to dampen our proclamation of the gospel. And we see this true in the Thessalonian believers in verse number 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You see, this church at Thessalonica was so resolute, so devout, so sold out in their lives to the Lord uh, that, that they, they refused to let even persecution and trial and difficulty dampen the, the, the efforts and the zeal of their message. This church at Thessalonica was so, is, is so used of God, has been so used of God since these days that even into the 8th and 9th centuries, men like Cyril of, the, of Thessalonica, uh, a church planting missionary who went to the regions of the, of the Slavic peoples in Eastern Europe and helped develop the Cyrillic alphabet with the sole intention of translating scripture and evangelizing the peoples of Eastern Europe. You know, these, this is the heartbeat of people that came out of churches like this because they were so sold out and so secure in their love for God and in their salvation. And they rejoiced in that security and they were thankful for that security. And that security uh, began to be emulated by a labor and work for God uh, that can only be uh, standing fast 
in, 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 in that kind of salvation that the Lord provides. And in reality, that steadfastness, that, 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 that resoluteness, that security will liberate the believer to be able to exercise great amounts of faith that will be the fuel that propels their witness from the near to the regions beyond as only God can do. And we find that in verses number 7 through 9. We won't read it again for time's sake, but we do find here where because of their, joy, their joyful reception of the, Holy, of the, of the, of the gospel, uh, because of their rejoicing in the security they had in God, that God had so purposefully and so apparently led Paul to them, that in all of these things they were so uh, just overcome with, with this love for the Lord and what he had done for them that they could not but help to spread that to somebody else. And so I pray that's true for you and I this week. I pray that we would uh, meditate on the security we have in Christ, that, that it's not religion that saves us or works that saves us, but it is simply that moment when we were convicted of our sin and our need for to be, at, to be right with a holy God. And instead of relying on ourselves and justifying ourselves, we placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And by placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection, we then are, are, are made free from sin. We're made free from the bondage of sin. And we, are made, and we are protected or delivered from the wrath of God on those that have rejected the gospel call and the revelation that God has given them. And so because of, of, of our faith in Christ and because of all that, that God has done on our behalf, we can't help but joyfully go and with great zeal and great love and great labor go and take the gospel to everyone that was willing to listen and receive. And I pray that's your heart today. Let's, let's be checking our hearts this week. Let's, let's, let's meditate on that reality and ask ourselves, am I, am, I, am I zealous for the Lord? Do I allow my security in Christ to overwhelm me uh, with gratitude? And does that gratitude transfer into a great desire to, to not muddy the message of the gospel and try to water it down and make it more palatable, but rather to be more forceful and more zealous with, with our message so that people that are out there that are, that are lost in sin are not mistaken with what we're trying to say, but rather they hear a clear gospel presentation from those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that's the truth today. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're listening today. Maybe you've been trying to purchase your way to God through religion or through works or through money or through self or through self righteousness and doing things that are good works, trying to earn your way to heaven. I beg you, I plead with you today, don't rest in those things. They will get you nowhere, but rather rest upon the saving power of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished for you. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and trust the finished work of Christ, that he was sufficient, he is sufficient enough to, to, to restore you back to a holy God and, and give you a relationship with him that is durable, that is authentic, that is secure. And from there, God will be able to work in you to grow your faith and fruitfulness to him. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we come to you now and thank you for today. We do thank you for your great love for us, Lord, and, and, and really the great work of salvation that you've accomplished on our behalf. Lord, I pray that we would be as these Thessalonican believers, Lord, that we would, uh, or Thessalonian believers, that we would just, um, Lord, that we would just be so overwhelmed and so and marvel so much at the reality of what you've accomplished through Christ on our behalf. And Lord, I pray that we would just, uh, that it would just burn within us that we need to share that with somebody else, that we wouldn't just go through some religious motion or or just do something else that, that keeps us busy, but God, that we would just uh, be so fervent and steadfast um, in our desire to take the gospel to everybody who's able to listen. And Lord, that we would do all we can to get the scriptures to anywhere that they can go. Lord, we do love you. Thank you for your love for us now and all that you have done in our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Again, if this is your first time with us, please make sure you email or let us know or fill out a visitor card. And we sure would like to be able to touch base with you. Uh, keeping you in prayer this week, please keep us in prayer as we're trying to navigate this new uh, travel uh, ban. And the Lord, the Lord would uh, just reveal his hand of wisdom and direction and we would know what, we would, what he would have us to do during these days. But we do know he has a plan. We do rejoice in the reality that God is in control and we do trust him for those things. And so we look forward to seeing you in the days ahead, God willing.